model feed lines, and you so you want to use the, the correct uh, one. Uh, some of these ideas we got from uh, Joel, the skeleton sleeve, which is also called uh, a, uh, a a coupled resonator antenna, where you have where you get two bands uh, for the price of one, so to speak. Uh, we're also going to talk about a uh, J-Pole and Slim Jim, uh, they're almost the same thing, and uh, this, the only difference really is a slight better ability to, to tweak the uh, SWR on the so-called Slim Jim. The reason I put these in here is because if you go online, you'll find people claiming that the Slim Jim has all sorts of an extra 6 dB gain over uh, a uh, J-Pole. Uh, when, uh, I don't know, if, has there anybody besides me done modeling on a, using Easy Neck or anything? Okay, you, yeah, you have. And the fact is, is that models could be enlightening and they could be very confusing and they could lead you down a garden path. And so you have to uh, take them with, a, know when to take them with a grain of uh, salt. Uh, we're also uh, we're talking about a uh, six meter, two meter skeleton sleeve ground plane, i.e., uh, which can be modified for ten or ten and six. Uh, one of the things I've concentrated on or been working on are methods of construction that are as easy as possible. And the reason we're going to have it as a project because. Normally, when you want to buy this stuff, you, you don't want to buy three feet at a time, and so we have a roll so everybody can buy the, decide which antenna they want to make, and uh, then they just have to buy the uh, window line for it. Uh, next slide. And just remember, though, if you want to build a 160 meter. Uh, yeah, you go buy your own. You need a lot of window <laughs> line. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, one question. Would that, the old uh, twin lead antenna wire work, though, or you got to have that lot of uh, they, the, the answer is, to, to some extent, yes. And in fact, uh, I've got an example here. Okay. Uh, we started out, the, the, the original idea was to build the, uh, the, ground, the ground plane uh, in getting into it and uh, the construction details and whatnot. And doing the modeling, I've concluded that the ground plane is probably not the best way to best approach here. Uh, the benefit, there is some, some benefit, but if you want a two meter ground plane, you're better off uh, building a conventional one, which is very simple. You take one of these connectors and five 19 inch wires, one out of each hole here and one up the middle and you're done. And that is probably the best bet if you want a two meter ground plane. Shouldn't the ground planes be five eighths of the uh, dimension? Smaller than the no, the, well, no, you can build a ground plane with quarter waves. Uh, five eighths becomes. No, five eighths of the 19 inches. Uh, it, well, it's actually, it depends exactly the diameter and whether it's insulated or not, but no, it would be the better part of the 19 inches. Uh, I did a model, and I think I used, I used 19 inches where it came out exact, but I'm going to make some other references about models we're going to be going through, uh, looking what the sort of the plots that you can get, and also when you have to be suspicious. We have one in here that you have to be very suspicious of. Uh, the type of couple resonators, and one is, is that you get two bands with good performance. Uh, you don't get a lot of lobes on the second on the on the higher frequency band, whereas if you use a long uh, a band, a single wire on multiple bands, yes, you'll have a nice bilobe effect on one band, and then as you get higher, everything else gets kind of uh, you can get some pretty screwy patterns sometimes. Uh, basic forms and and the fact that they are easily constructed, the easy way to do it is with this uh, so-called window line. Uh, and Joel uh, has uh, had some articles in QST. Uh, the straight, uh, it's easier to construct. Uh, and
and it's easier to construct and it's less expensive only because you can do something. You, you use the window line for the center part and then you tack on just plain wire for, for the other band. But the folded takes up less space. On an 80 meter you can save about 10 feet of, of space and if you're in a lot where 10 feet is important then you go with the folded. Uh, the uh, dipole, now which, when you say, one of the things is you gotta be very careful when you're talking about better on antennas, because depending on exactly where you are and what you're trying to do determines which antenna is better. And of course, one of the factors is what polarization do you want. If you're trying, if you're on two meters, and you want to talk sideband, you want to be horizontally polarized anyhow. Uh, but also dipoles tend to, there's an old saying about verticals, they are equally bad in all directions, unless you're living on a boat. <laughs> uh, which case a vertical on the, on the sound could be extremely effective. Uh, the uh, and the, sl the slim jim, which and I have the, the the makings of a slim jim, and I ha have a commercially made one using the twin lead that Bill was asking about. Uh, where would you use them? You'd use them uh, like for special events where you have supposing you're you're uh, on a bicycle thing and you're way out and all you have is a handheld, the rubber ducky, which is a semi-dummy load actually, in fact that's the secret of how they work, <laughs> is they're made deliberately to be a semi-dummy <laughs> load, uh, has a somewhat limited range and this way you get over that. Uh, vacation, emergencies, public temporary replacement, uh, have something, storm comes and your good antenna comes down and you need to get something up quick. Uh, next slide. Now uh, here is the basic, uh, this is from Joel. Uh, the Excuse me for a minute, when he says Joel, he means Joel Alice. Yes. Who until recently was the ARRL's technical expert, the guy who wrote the technical expert column. So just so we understand who Joel is. Yeah, W1ZR. Uh, uh, in fact, he gave a talk before this club, so some of you may, may remember him uh, being here. Uh, one thing I want to comment on, and that is that you'll notice he recommends some beads. And a lot of people will say, well, how many beads? Or how do you figure out what you need the way of beads? And when do you need the beads? Uh, beads are important if you do have a situation where the, there's a significant SWR, uh, and, and particularly if you're running significant power. Well, you explain what the beads do? Yes, so let's, I'm getting to that. Uh, okay. Uh, the beads actually are to prevent current coming back on the outside of the coax. And some people have experienced running a lot of power and have current back and they get zapped in the shack and things like that. The, how do you select the beads? Uh, the beads, uh, you want a bead that is, just fits over the coax that you're using. And so the beads come in standard sizes to fit standard coax. Uh, they have different frequency characteristics. The rule of thumb is when you buy the beads uh, for a particular band, you want 10 times your coax impedance uh, represented in the beads. Uh, one bead is typically 100 ohms, you know, it depends on the kind, but, uh, and so usually you end up with about 500, five, five of them because you want a 500 ohm effective impedance. There are other things you can do. Sometimes you just make an air coil choke, you wrap up some coax uh, and the number of turns depending on the band and, and that also uh, will work. Uh, there's something else and that is using lossy coax so that, uh, yeah, the, 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 it doesn't make it all the way back to you, to you and that's something else we're gonna show. Right. Uh, question. Um. Just for the benefit of the club, I know where to get these beads, and I also have ordered a whole bunch of them and can uh, provide to members of the club. 
oh, did you get a good price? Because yes. well, I was going to order some, and, and the prices were like 3 to 4 or $5. Split meat, they come either solid or split, by the way. These are solid for RG8X. Right. Okay. And, um, I think I got like 50 cents of a beef, 50 to, to a dollar. Well, that's damn cheap. And and what was their rated resistance of they're, two they're mega? Type, I think they're type 31. So I picked ones for the, the normal HF frequency range. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I'll, I'll just yeah, well, okay. But that's good because what I was looking at, the, the prices are high. Otherwise, if I could get some at 50 cents, I would have brought them with me. <laughs> uh, yes? What are the, I can't see the dimensions there. What? Well, the, well, this is this. Uh, okay, here, 56 feet. This is uh, for the, I guess, uh, would be for the 40 meter, uh, 40, uh, 20 meter uh, example. We have a chart which we're going to flash. Everybody has to memorize it because they'll never see it again for the rest of the life. Do you want to flash that chart? <laughs> there it is. Okay. Now we're going to count down for the memorization. The, the fact is that this is in the example of the folded version. Uh, we also have dimensions for the straight version. Uh, and you can see that when it makes a big difference when you're at 160 uh, meters, uh, you may want to save that. Uh, I guess you'd save about 20 feet or so. On this chart, but look at 75 meters, 110 feet versus 121 feet. Yes, yeah, so 11 feet, and 160. I figured would be about twice that. So, so anyhow, so you do save. So you so you do save. Uh, it's just that you have to use the window line for the full length. And all this will be on the website, right? Yes. Yeah. All of our. Now, when you're talking about the fold, did you talk about the ends coming up and around? Yeah. Okay. You see how this this is called a fold here. Okay. Right. Rather than just going out yeah, straight, so you, so it, down. sort sort of sort of uh, the modeling, and I'm going to. Uh, you want to go to the next one? I think that's just another. Uh, this is the unfolded, so you can see that uh, you the, the the distance is there. The uh, big difference is always the low the low band, and and the one of the characteristics that, which is rather interesting, when you have just a plain dipole up high and clear stuff and whatnot, it has an impedance of about 70 ohms. Uh, when you do this uh, coupled resonator, the impedance is brought down to close to 50 ohms. So that you can, if you do things right, you can get a very good match on two ba bands, very close to 50 ohms on both of them, as a matter of fact. Uh, now, the, you can't do it in all combinations because obviously there's a proportionality that if you were at, at 80 meters and you wanted to really do things right, you'd want to have what's called ladder line where you have them six inches apart or, or more. There was a design that was in QST where they had a, uh, a 80, 75 meter version because as you know, 80 meters, to make an antenna that's flat on, at, at, at 75 and 80 is kind of difficult. But if you have the two wires, uh, the coupled resonator, you have one for 80 meters for the CW, and then you cut another wire and space it off a few inches for somewhere as close to the 75 meter, close to 4 uh, megahertz, uh, you will end up with almost flat across the whole band. Okay, the uh, next one. Do you, do you model the uh, beads, Fred? Do, do I put them in the model? No, I just all I do is uh, what, what you do is you just make sure you've got five, at least five hundred. All you're going to have more. It's, it's just and the five hundred is sort of like a rule of thumb. Uh, there are times where you, your mess match isn't all that great, and one or two might do it. I've seen some people say, "Oh yeah, you put on a bead," but. If you need A B, you probably need more than one. And if you can get if you can get them cheap, an 8X is a great material because it's small enough for a lot of things, and still some some forms of it are a little bit less lossy than others. Uh, and this is this is showing it down at the six and two meter 
thing, which was not original. The, Joel provided this. It wasn't, I believe, in the original QST article because he figured this out when I asked him to. <laughs> uh, okay, the next one. And this is the unfolded version. And here is, believe it or not, one of our proposed uh, cu uh, club things, which is not only designed for simplicity, but minimal cost. Okay, let it twist so it's straight. Uh, twist it in your hand. Yeah. Well, by the way, they, they okay. generally wreck. No, no, no. no that's all. Okay. Okay. Yeah, twist. Yeah, all right. Sure. Okay. So this, this is a equivalent. This is the unfolded for six and two meters. Yeah. And we did everything. I, I, I tried two different systems for coupling the wires together. Uh, the easiest and cheap, cheapest are using the crimp ring connectors. And if you have a soldering iron and can back up the crimping with the soldering, I highly recommend it. There's a couple of comments I want to make about crimping, and that is crimping tools. You can get things like this at Radio Shack. Uh, you can find a Radio Shack. I mean, yeah, well, <laughs> yeah. or you used to be able to. Well, also hardware stores and whatnot. And then on these, you get it a kit and it's not all that expensive. There's only one problem. problem, and that is that they kind of crappy in the performance. Uh, if you, you even crimping by pushing down on your desk and whatnot, things fell apart. <laughs> John can tell you. The, 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 if you use these, these are, I think, about 15 bucks and have a nice little clipper on the end and whatnot. But boy, is the crimp better when you use the real tool compared to that, that thing. Also, wire strippers. Now, I brought this along because it's my favorite wire stripper. It's older than me, believe it. I believe it's older than me. Mm -hmm. I got it from my father, <laughs> and I remember it, it, it may be vintage World War II, but it still works perfectly. It's the best wire clipper I've ever had. Oh, uh, definition of not working with iron in the Bronze Age. Uh, <laughs> oh, you're going back to the, the when the, we wrote back and forth with the Bostrophodon writing again? That's sure. I just had a crazy idea. When you're doing the crimping and you're going to planning to solder, why not take a small piece of solder and put it in with the wires and crimp right the solder right in there? All you have to do is heat the thing and you got the whole thing. You don't have to just go chasing it around. around. You know, that's an excellent idea well, if, yeah. if, 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 if it will fit. But usually, usually you don't have room to fit solder in Well, it. you can get a couple of thin, you know, you don't need much. You just yeah. need no, to get some. What in. happens then is the solder is taking up space. Yeah, well, then you, you crimp it again. But once you solder it, and it's loose. Solder, yeah, but then you can then just the crimp, it, uh, crimp it again okay, and crimp another it again. space. So yeah, I, it, you, 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 usually what, it, what I always do is the I make, hardest thing that's putting two wires together is to keep, make them hot, stay together while you're putting the solder on. Well, you here's, you got you together, it, then you solder. Yeah, yeah. yeah, well, what I usually do is I make, is I, on this type of thing, I make sure the wire is, the, the wire is stuck through so I, can, so I can see it on this side. So then I have a spot where I can solder in. It's, okay. it's open. And, and, I, and, and normally it, it sucks right in anyhow. So solder, if you have a soldering iron, and eventually all hams should have a soldering iron. And, and at least no rule number one of the soldering iron. Don't pick up the hot end. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. <laughs> do they st children don't play with those anymore, do they? It's a reason, Brandon. My grandson did. He picked it up on the hot end. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, well, I, I'm not going to get into my misspent youth here. Uh, the next slide. Okay, now we're getting into some uh, what you can, what you do happens when you play with a modeling program. Now there are a number of them out, out there. The, this is with Easy Deck, which is probably for hams the number one uh, commercial program. Uh, you can also go online. There's one called MMANA, and there's a there's an associated program also. Uh, with it, which I've forgotten 
well, if you look up for MMA and A, you'll 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 find it. The the MMA and A program is free. Uh, its drawback is is that it's all metric, and it uses some units which American hams don't use, particularly uh, the, the the unit for feed line loss. We always use dB per hundred feet, and they don't use that in the in, in the rest of the world. But uh, you. The two things that you generally interested in is the elevation plot and the azimuth uh, plot. And depending on the band, uh, you, you, usually you're trying to get elevations flat. There are times like when you're trying to use the vertical uh, incident uh, stuff where you want to have it pointing straight up. But on six meters, uh, this is sort of a, in the, this, these numbers are probably a little bit generous. Uh, it has 6.9 dB over the isotropic. Now, a dipole is 2.3 or whatever. Uh, this, but this, this, these numbers are, are at least believable, and the pattern looks fairly reasonable. I didn't print out. You can also, with easy neck, you can also get the 3D view, too. Uh, Excuse me for a minute. Does everyone understand what these two graphs are showing? What these two diagrams are? Anybody wants an explanation? Yes. Okay. Okay. Elevation means uh, you're looking at the antenna this way. I want an explanation, please. What? Mm -hmm. I don't. I don't understand them. Seriously. Well, that's what he's explaining. Yeah. What you mean? Okay. 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 Elevation is. When you're going from the horizon, from straight level, up overhead, that's what this represents. In other words, in the preferred direction, uh, this represents straight overhead, this represents towards the horizon, and the main, the, the strongest point is at an angle of uh, 35 degrees from the, uh, Andy? Can you explain what axis the antenna is is at in that diagram? What position? Oh, okay. Is the, antenna? the the antenna would be coming out, out of yeah. the coming out at you this way. Looking, you're looking. This is looking at the in this case looking at the end of the antenna. The antenna is actually over on this drawing. The azimuth. It, the antenna is running like this. As a di look at it as a dipole like this. So in, in that drawing, you're over the antenna looking down, and you want to see what directions it radiates. Yeah. In the first one, you're looking at the end of the antenna and saying, how high does it radiate? The the take that way, way, does it radiate yeah. what's called the takeoff angle? Yeah. Okay, is everybody clear now on azimuth and elevation? Okay, you want to go to the next one because that has some, I think it's the next one, has some interesting properties. Now, either we have a miracle antenna, or we've run into the limitations of what happens when you do modeling. This is showing a very low takeoff angle uh, with a gain of 9.37 dB, which is like, it's like uh, working like a beam. And you look over here, and by golly, it's sort of a funny looking bi-directional beam here. With a fairly uh, fairly narrow lobe, uh, when you come up with something like that, you don't go running around claiming you've invented a new antenna until you've tested it <laughs> and actually verified it, because this uh, could be an anomalous situation. Uh, I did follow the the, the standard rules uh, of uh, I've had uh, extensive uh, discussions both with uh, Joel Hellis and with uh, uh, Roy Llewellyn, who wrote Easy Deck, uh, on uh, trying to avoid this sort of situation. And modelers are always on the lookout for something that just looks too good to be true. Mm -hmm. uh, it, there may be some, some gain, and, it's, and it, it has entirely to do not so much with the antenna itself, but how the antenna is reacting with the ground underneath. The three most important factors on how an antenna works actually are location, location, and location. Height above ground and the characteristics of the ground 
determine everything. Everybody's probably encountered some, at some point, somebody says they have a such and such antenna, it works great, and somebody says, I had one and it, it stank. Well, they may both be right. They just didn't have the exact same circumstances where they had, particularly antennas like a G5RV are very likely to have wide ranges on how they behave for different people. Okay, you wanna go to the next one? And this is the, the, the uh, plot on SWR. Now, in this particular, and this is something where you can play around with. Uh, I, as I say, modeling programs are addictive. And you, you, I spent too many hours <laughs> trying to. If you're to, an MIT engineer, modeling programs are addictive. <laughs> but the, the big the thing is, is that the two meters, you're able to. You, you, you can model it. Now, when you go and you put in the dimensions that you put in the model, you cut the real thing, and you go out and you test it, is it going to come out with that? The answer is probably not. Uh, the models have to make an assumption, and there was one assumption which uh, I, I got from Joel because because uh, he's had a lot more experience uh, with the league and whatnot. Uh, when wire is insulated, uh, the thickness of the insulation and the dielectric constant uh, change the velocity factor and therefore the length of, of antenna. The more, the higher the dielectric constant, the thicker it is, uh, then the shorter that you need. But what is the thickness of the insulation on this stuff? It's obviously not uniform. It doesn't go around. You got most of the way. It's only 17,000 thick, but then you have this web in here, and you notice the web has a pattern, you know, long and short, which is another factor. Uh, and according to Joel, you use 60,000 thickness in your modeling program. Well, he used. He may have modeled on a. He modeled using a, an 18 gauge. I'm using 16 gauge. The characteristics of that web may be a little bit different. And in fact, if you measure impedance of uh, window line, different manufacturers will be slightly different. They're all in the range from 390, you're usually between 395 and 405 or so. But, uh, and, and, and I've even seen a caution that sometimes the same kind can vary a little bit. So when you, that's why you always have to make the antenna, and it's always better to add a little scooch the first time and cut back because it's easier to cut back than to add on. Next, uh, next one. Now, another antenna that I, I, I looked at uh, as a project because the J-Pole it was the first antenna I ever made as a ham radio operator. And uh, I made it out of twin lead. There was, uh, and I wish I could find the dimensions of the original one I had because it was, it, it, it was a little bit different, a little shorter uh, than this. Uh, it worked very nicely. You got the, the way you got the SWR, you matched it. I had a meter, is you hung it from different places and depending where you hung it, then that determined what the SWR was. Now I found that right in the middle of the doorway was the perfect place, and every time I try operating, somebody tried walking through the door and they knock it down. <laughs> uh, now, if you go on, you'll find a variation which has come out in recent years I wasn't aware of. It called the Slim Jim, and they look an awful lot alike. If you go to the site, some of the sites with the Slim Jim say, oh, it's so much better that, there's, that the pattern gives you an extra 6 dB of gain over the J-pole. Is the Slim Jim shorted on top? Yeah, it, it's, it's I, I, I went through the model. I, I mean, I immediately, there's certain things that you have to, to, to realize about antennas that certain physical sizes have a certain capture area and whatnot, and you, there are limits as to what can happen. 
and the 60B was not logic, it was, didn't seem logical, and guess what? When I ran the models, the, there was a few tets of a DB, but that's modeling error and not anything significant. So don't expect the Slim Jim to give you an extra 6 dB. That is one thing that the Slim Jim apparently does give you, and you want to go to the, I think it should be there, next slide. Uh, okay, this is the j pole, And you notice the j pole is pretty good on SWR, and maybe with a little tweaking it could have done a little better. Uh, it's, its gain is about what a dipole should be, actually. Uh, I mean, it's 2.5 dB. It's fairly, I didn't put, because uh, it's an antenna is going to be pretty much omnidirectional, I didn't put in the uh, uh, azimuth uh, plot. And it's fl fairly flat on SWR. Uh, you want to go to the next one? Those are the Slim Jim. And I was able, the, the gain, the, the difference between 2.5 and 2.78 is, does not mean anything. Uh, but I did get the SWR below 1.5 across the whole band because I had that other half I could tweak a little bit just so that it, it would, so you had one side sort of uh, hitting the, taking the low end and the other side sort of, uh, and maybe if I had more time to play with it, I could have gotten a little flatter, but until you actually make one, it probably doesn't do you any good to play with the program that much more. Uh, okay, you want to go to the next one? Okay, yeah, this one is... Do you want to go back to the graphs? Uh, no, we don't have to go back. I, I, the, what, did you skip a graph? No, no, I just no. wanted to know if you... No. Okay, this was this is what the project started out on, uh, and and I do did make the components for it. Uh, I'm not sure whether it's really an antenna that would be all that useful, but it's it, it's still a good idea to understand. And and, and for somebody, there may be a situation uh, where they do need an antenna that's a vertical. Uh, and uh, it doesn't have to be too high up in the air. They're not in position to put in lots of radials and things like that. And so this has the radials uh, resonant on, uh, it, so this will work on two bands as a vertical. Uh, and, and I made it, I, I unfortunately didn't get around to buying enough short screws to screw everything together, but I do have the three Where's the third section? Go? It's around here someplace. Oh, here it is. But it's actually not too difficult to, to do. And then these are held together with, with, with screws. Uh, I also looked into an alternate way of attaching the wires. Uh, this is a more expensive way. Uh, these are called posi locks. But those screws, they 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 do they are held, they're, they're threaded and whatnot. And anyhow, it's you put them together by hand. There's no crimper, no screws. You get a perfectly straight line right through. Uh, I don't. I wouldn't put this with a huge load endwise on it. For a moderate load for a small antenna, the posi lock. Is is a way to go. Uh, is 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 but one option. You, you need to step back from it. You haven't explained why you've got a piece of wire dangling out there, and this none of these pictures have any wire. Yeah, because this there. is the folded version, and this is the unfolded version. That's why. Well, the, no. What, what you've yeah. done is you've replaced a section of the ladder line, which is expensive stuff. How much does it cost? The, the, the ladder line is fifty cents a foot, and, and this, this is about five cents a foot. So in a, in so one of these antennas. You're normally going to cut and and use and not use part of that ladder line. So why use fifty cent ladder line when you can use five cent wire? Yeah, you could Maybe. just as easily make this one piece of ladder line. Yes, you could. You're going to cut here, so this the top piece of the ladder line isn't used in any way. So Fred is saving you saving some money, but that's why he's doing yeah. it. Yeah. And the frugal. 
Yes, that, that's the thing. And I'm, I, the, it's, the keeping in spirit with, with, the, with the fact that hams are damn cheap bastards. So you have two different velocity factors on the same wire. There's not much difference, though, because this, this, the, the insulation thickness of like this is the same as what this was modeled as. So they came out the same, that was the, which was the interesting, the, the, the interesting uh, uh, part of it. And uh, also, this, way, this stuff, you could make up this in several lengths, and this just unscrews, and you could screw on another piece of wire. So you want to say, oh, I wanted 10 meters. Well, you cut a piece twice as long as this one, and you just unscrew, stick it in, and now you have a 10 meter, 2 meter uh, uh, antenna. So I was trying to come up with ways to make these versatile and and something that you that you could use uh, for something. Now, what's our next? Uh, I'm a little confused on that, sure. Fred. I'm looking at your coax attached to the. Uh, the ground plane and the driven element. Yep. You're attached to the six meter uh, point of the driven element. Yes, you always, yes. And the six meter point of the ground plane. That's correct. How does the two meter? No, because uh, remember we're talking about the uh, couple resonators. The two meter is a couple resonator uh, antenna. Let so it's that. coupled by RF rather than. Yeah. That's right. That it's interface. Yes. Remember this slide. There's nothing attached. This is the, this is the, the higher frequency piece. There's nothing attached yeah. to that at all. It's, it's just coupled. It's just coupled. Fred? Yeah. On the, the posi lock, is it a sleeve that's threaded on the inside and you just twist the wires in or? At, it, at yeah, the, the posi lock actually. I have another one, a, a posi tap, which I also got, and I haven't figured out a good place to use it, but it might be handy where you can use the same principle to tap into a wire at right angles to pull off another wire. Uh, it might work on the J-pole, for example. It has a pin that would just pierce through the, the strands and the, the stranded wire. But this is the posi lock. The, the end screw out. There's old plastic. See this? This okay. thing here. Now you shove the wire through. It's, you have to cut the ends. And it only works with threaded wire, by the way. And then, and when you push that down in there, and then screw this thing in, it will. That's what locks it. And so that you now have a completely coaxial. Okay. Got you. Well, you pass that around for it. Sure. Fred. Yeah. I assume when you deploy this antenna, it has to be deployed in this configuration, right? With 90 degree angles. Uh, no, they're not nine. Okay. Uh, this is actually the. The, the actual antenna, this is vertical, and these are actually down at 45 degrees. Oh, I see, so it's all in one plane. That's all in one plane? Yeah. You know, they say, well, you know, trying to depict that is, uh, and, and so it's clear, it's a little bit, might be a little bit confusing. But the fact is, is that this comes out, these three, uh, because the ground plane, normally you have your ground, the, the ground plane part is, is at 45 degrees or close to it. Because uh, that's the point where you get closest to a 50 ohm uh, mat. Normally, a lot, the only thing about this ground plane is is that you only have two legs. Where if you're building one, usually you would you build one using one of these, you have four legs. So it's the pattern on this is going to be not perfectly symmetrical. Sure. Now, is it necessary to use? Uh, beads on that uh, feed line, or can't you just roll up some hanks and wire? Well, that's what I said at the beginning. We, you can roll up some wire. That's that's the other thing. Or if you use lossy wire, which I have a demonstration of here. Uh, let's, what's the uh, next slide? 
Okay, the, okay. this is your memory test. Remember, <coughs> everybody has to remember all these numbers. You have 10 seconds. Uh, Fred, you're yes. at the screen. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I'm interfering with somebody's memory here. All right. Uh, anyhow, these are the, some of the examples. You could, you could, he has even figures for 80 meters, but the fact is that you would have to have a, a rather tall tree to haul the thing up. And, 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 and what you have to do is you then have, you, you have to, you, this was intended so that you'd hang, you'd hang the vertical uh, down and then the two ground plane things you would tie to something at the appropriate distances away so that you form that, uh, that uh, the, the configuration that you want. Okay, you want to go to the next one? Uh, this is basically the dimensions with the unfolded version. If you're going to build the coupled resonator ground plane, you probably damn well need to use the folded because you'll never. Well, you, 40 you, 20 is not bad. You, it's not that hard to get something 30 feet up in a tree. Uh, it's more than 30 feet because it's 30 feet plus 0.7 times 30 feet, so it's about 50 feet. Right. Remember, you got the 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 the. Yeah, You've got the right, vertical right. and then the... Right. Okay, now this is all memorized now. Uh, okay, the next one. And uh, this is uh, the, uh, for six meters, the elevation. Actually, you see that we do have, uh, this is a little squished down. We got a little bit better uh, SWR there. In this case, you don't aim for the aim. on 650 megahertz. You don't aim for the middle of the band. You aim for 51 megahertz or thereabouts, because almost everything's going to be at the bottom end of the band anyhow. Uh, the next one: uh, materials for a dipole. Well, it's very simple. Uh, the, for the dipole that we're talking about as a possible plug. Well, this is six and two. This is six and two. You need three feet. You need three feet of 16 speaker wire, or 18. This may be 18 speaker wire, but anyhow, and you split it down. So you're talking about very uh, cheap. Uh, the um, eyelet, or they're also known as ring connectors. Uh, the, 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 that's these things that you crimp on. And uh, 50 ohm uh, a coax with a connector, and that would be well something like this, uh, or it could be a short one. Uh, this is a nice combination. It's got the male and female, so no matter what, you're all set. And you just put the connectors on and screw them together. If you're going to leave it outside, you you want to get stainless steel hardware probably. Uh, the other thing is, or you wrap it up there. There's, there are a number of things that you can wrap it up. Temporary, does not, what is not bad, use vinyl tape. Uh, if you want something that's got to be sealed up a little better, you can get this stuff, which is a rubber tape. You can get this in any hardware store, peels the thing, peels apart. You wrap it or it stretches around and whatnot. There's also, you can get, uh, silicone tape, uh, which is considered a lot more durable, and there's also a, a substance called coax seal that uh, is sometimes sold to seal, to seal up connectors. So you have a number of choices, but you know if you're if you're building something like that, this is probably the easiest stuff to use and is readily available. Could you feed it with coax with a ballon? Yes, you could. The the, the ballon and the uh, the basically the 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 standard ballons that that you have are basically they got the beads inside. <laughs> you know, well, the, the, I mean, there's a couple of different types. Yeah. Somewhere because you have the the if you have a ratio or not, but a standard you can have the, the you can have the you can get things that are basically. Uh, PVC tube with end caps and whatnot, and a piece of coax in there, and, and beads on it. 
But the, these are 50 ohm antennas. The, these are these are not antennas that are two presenting two. No, but if you're going a distance, holes. then you're. Uh, You'd have less loss with the ladder line. No, no, no. The only Yo, thing yeah, I'm yeah. If you, okay, you're talking about running ladder line to the antenna and then Correct. matching. Now, with the that, that is that's a very okay. That's a there's a popular misconception that if you did that, that you always use a ballon, and it turns out you got to measure each time because you may or may not need a ballon. You're looking. People are confused. Say the apparent impedance that they get from the ladder line hooked to something which is not at the impedance of the ladder line and it all depends on the wavelength and where they hit on the on the thing and you have to actually measure it uh, the, the the blind assumption that oh yeah it's it's a higher impedance line therefore I put the step up balance is 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 wrong it, it, it can go anyway uh, there is a very good program written by somebody with a call of K1FC that's actually on their website. Uh, it's a very technical program, but not too many people will figure out how to use it. But if you do, you find it's an extremely powerful program called SWR Plot. And what it does is that it actually determines if you know the impedance at the antenna. You know the characteristics and length of the feed line. It'll tell you what you've got at the other end of the feed line, and it works both ways. If you measure the impedance at the at, at your end of the feed line, and you want to know what the antenna is, well, if you you put in that length of feed line with its characteristics, that'll you'll you'll then know what the antenna impedance is. It works both ways. It also calculates your uh, power loss so that if you if you're putting in 100 watts it tells you how many watts actually gets radiated it's a good problem it requires a cuneiform operating system so, and, and any, anybody wants to to, to 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 write their own just remember you better know how to write a program to solve uh, hyperbolic functions with complex numbers because that's what's involved with, on feed lines. That's why people use cheat, use Smith's charts. Is that going to be on the next SAT test? <laughs> it should. It should. If I were writing it, I'd make sure you. When it made it to the ACT a long time ago. Uh, I don't know how. I, I think the only the only two people who use uh, hyperbolic functions are. Some electrical engineers and some uh, structural designers. If you're design, does anybody know what structural design uses the hyperbolic cosine? The answer is the arch, the perfect arch, or or the catenary. No, oh, since they are the inverse, one is the inverse of the other. Uh, do we have anything else in there, or is that is, is the whole thing open? Okay, I do have some things about the assembly. Uh, some recommendations. You don't have to do them, but I, 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 I did it uh, thinking that in terms of engineering, uh, before you cut anything here to separate it, you take a small drill like an eighth inch or thereabouts and you drill holes through and then you cut to the hole. And ideally, and, 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 and the only reason this wasn't was because I had to reap it repurpose a piece of coax I'd already cut rather than wasting something new. Ideally, you would center it on the wide section so you've got plenty of structure. This way you're making an antenna. You don't need any fancy doodads for the middle. You've got a good solid metal. You drill the two holes and then cut to the holes. That way you have uh, what's called uh, uh, the, uh, avoiding a strain concentration and reducing your chance of failure. Uh, it's probably not likely to happen uh, on an antenna this size, but if you do a larger one. And uh, anyhow, uh, it's, and this is where I talked about the, the longer section. Uh, then you cut the slit, cut the wire at the mid pipe, bend the strip, cut and free the strip, the same grip on the ring connectors or eyelets. Anyhow, it's pretty much self explanatory here. Uh, you don't need me to read it to you. Uh, 
but we what we were contemplating is for our next meeting if if there is interest people let us know what antennas they want to build and we will have uh, all the all the parts uh, available uh, so you just need to donate the cost of the parts this way it's a lot cheaper you can build an antenna like this for what three or four dollars uh, that uh, if you went online to buy it it would be a lot more but I have some I do have a commercial one which I do I, which I actually pop for it doesn't have it has there's a reason why uh, I, I, I went with the commercial for this it, this is actually a Essentially a J pole. Actually, I think it's actually technically it maybe a slim jim. Uh, he used uh, this wire, this coax. It's uh, I think it's what 170. 173. Or 173. 173. Okay. Yes. And with one of these little connectors, and I'll be damned if I could ever assemble that. I don't know. Maybe you can't stand. No, I can't even see it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But you. The one thing is it avoids needing the beads. The reason is, is that this 173 is kind of lossy and it takes care. Oh, yeah, so there's a little mismatch, but it's not going to make it back anyhow. If we're going to build them next, next month, I've got plenty of that coax that I'll donate. This stuff, the yep. 173? Are you going to solder the connections? I'll donate the coax. <laughs> Uh, but this this is made by the traditional uh, television uh, twin lead, and uh, this is intended. This is specifically for the bow fang, uh, and it, it, its main purpose was to enable me with the bow fang to work the Weka repeater, which I just <laughs> sort of. Yeah, you moved, you got better. It could be because. I'm sitting in the chair, it's hanging behind me, and Weka's in front of me, so I'm sort of yeah, tuning the antenna. I can pick out your voice. Yeah. I actually yeah. got into the Weka repeater with my That's let Fred get to the beat of the presentation, guys. It's 9.05. I'd yeah. like to hear this. Fred, take it from there. Fred, I got a question for you. <laughs> what would the difference be That's it. He's done. Yeah. between using a dipole in a vertical position versus the J-pole? They would be functionally pretty close to the same uh, because uh, the J-pole is actually an end-fed dipole. Uh, the, what it is, is is that that bottom piece is a stub uh, to a matching stub to because the dipole, when you try to end-feed a dipole, it has a very high impedance. So basically, you have that stub that is, and everything's done, dimensions just right so that it matches the impedance. Is it easier to build the dipole and use it vertically than the jet? No, it's not. Well, no, the, the, no, it's not because, because the problem, problem is feeding. You have to, this it, thing. You, if you pull off straight you, from this, you have to come that's off that's straight for quite a while. Yeah. That's yeah. why it's not easier. Well, it depends. There are circumstances where it can be easier. Uh, it, 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 here again, everything depends on the location. Uh, Bill, you had a question? Uh, I saw an article for a two-band J-pole uh, with, with an isolating stub between the sections. Is, this, is there any equivalent for a Slim Jim, a two-band Slim Jim? Well, okay, when I modeled it, it turns out, and because as you know, antennas usually will work on the third harmonic, and the 440 is more or less the uh, third harmonic. Well, the designer uh, found the, the performance was actually running okay. on the third harmonic. Well, what it happens is, the, okay, here's the thing. It modeled, you couldn't get, you could, it was a small fraction that the SWR was good. Uh, the, the, in my models I was hitting, depending on which one, around uh, 440 and one, 450 on the other. Uh, in reality, you'd have to measure it, and, and unfortunately, I don't have the fancy uh, MFJ uh, to measure 440. I have 
the regular MFJ here, uh, and uh, which is great for two meters. So theoretically, yes. Uh, in the model, I got a bad, a, a rather, it was showing a lot of energy going up. Whether in reality that would be the case, I don't know. <coughs> so now there are others. I've seen designs with non, uh, you know, you can build slim gyms out of copper pipe and things like that. And I've seen things with double studs and, and things like that. And, and, and one, one, somebody had one where they had, had the 440 at right angles. So there are, there are things. I tried to do the couple resonator by, and I, and I had so-so results. It, it, it takes physical experimenting with the, before I can tell you that there, what you really can do. Okay, any other questions? Because Terry's anxious to go. Right. Right. Just to see the rest of your presentation. That's it. No, this is this is it. Okay, now you can go. Look, Look, Terry's getting ask old. any question you'd like. If that's uh, I just want to say something. Yeah. We started off at a board's meeting, decided to build something, <coughs> and then the problem was we didn't want to have a soldering iron in the government center. <laughs> <laughs> and Fred, you've taken it a long distance. I mean, we've we've worked out a lot. He's worked out a lot of very interesting ways of assembling things without using a soldering iron. And not only gives you the flexibility of getting different measure, uh, different lengths of wire and everything else, so I think starting off with a simple premise, we wound up with, with a, more, a far more complex thing, but a lot more versatility. And you, you put a lot into it, and I think you deserve a hand. Uh, uh, Fred, yeah? one more question now. If we're going to build them next month, yeah. How many want to build which different antennas, and what would the cost be of each one? Okay, the cost, uh, the, co the, the cost of this uh, window line is 50 cents a foot. So the simplest antenna, it's a dollar and a half for the window line. Uh, you're talking about probably from anywhere from three to six dollars. Well, also if whether people want to buy the uh, 50 cent beads, which is a, a real bargain. And I'd hi I highly would recommend, uh, now that we ha have some, is that uh, uh, we uh, get some, uh, somebody must have some, a few feet of R RG8X or something. That's for the, be the beads, so that we'll, we'll work it out. Because it th the antenna doesn't do you much good unless you have, you know, something on it. And, and one possibility I was thinking was is that you'd have a, Oh, this this, I just, this is only this light because I found it in my scrap pile. <laughs> uh, the, the, it's not that's not real scientific, but I, I, it struck me that yeah, it'd be really handy to have have a thing with the beads, the connectors, and now you have a something that you could use on different antennas. You could fool around and make different things. Uh, that this this whole project is to get people to say, well, I've made an antenna. And I've tried it out when when we do it. We, before we uh, go, and I will have to uh, do some outdoor testing. The weather between my work schedule and the weather, uh, I did not get the testing time that was to to get it down to the last eighth of an inch type thing. Uh, are, are there any more questions? Otherwise, what what do you think about focus on two possibilities? The J pole is usually used as a vertical. All it is is an in-fed zep, not an in-fed dipole, but an in-fed zep. Oh, it's half wave. Okay, and it's, um, it can be used vertically or horizontally. All an in-fed zep is is a, is a half wave antenna, a half wave wire with a quarter wave matching stuff, okay? Steve, remember this because the quarter, the, the, the stub, <laughs> the stub matching is a frequent question on the, on the extra. Okay. Yeah. And don't is, confuse it with stud matching right. either. Okay, <laughs> that would be like match.com match and you know, things like that. All right, so this is a quarter wave. You can find a spot on here that looks like 50 ohms to your transmitter, and yet at the same time up here it's matching this long wire, which is a very high impedance. You can operate it, ma you can operate it vertically or horizontally. Now, if you're doing six meters, that's a six meter that would be four meters long that's about 12 feet 15 feet that's all you you need 
You can hang a 15 foot vertical very easily, you can hang a 15 foot horizontal very easily. So if you want to do six meter FM, you hang it vertically, you want to do six meter sideband, you hang it horizontally. Or the other thing is the dipole. These are the easiest to build, they're pretty easy to build. And if you want to do, if you want to get on six meter sideband, a, a six meter horizontal would be very good, would work perfectly. With the two meter, with the two meter match, I'm sorry, with the two meter uh, skeleton, you can get on six and two meter sideband. Yeah, and, and if the and if the model turns out to be has some validity, it would work fantastically on two meter sideband. But I'm not making any you promises. Know, I would chime in on that was if anyone's just looking for some direction in terms of what to go. There's a lot of people who just swear by the J poles as the ultimate emergency communication antenna going in the mailbox. So if you're looking for something basic with good return in terms of usefulness, the J pole is a good thing to use. Yeah, the J-Pole is about feet, five feet long. So for 30 you, feet, you can put it up, you get one of these weighted bags, and you just up into a tree. You don't throw it like that. You do it like this. Up into a tree, you can get it 30 feet. If you're good, you can get it up 50 feet. <laughs> Nobody here can do that. No, no, no. <laughs> no, I've practiced with John. Those are good. You got, you, got fi you got 50 feet? Huh? Yeah, John Colatai. What's his no, name? mostly 30, 40 feet in my case. Yeah, so, yeah they work. <laughs> if you've got a 15-foot antenna, you know, for vacation, for portable operations, you could put up a 10 meter or 15 meter vertical. What's the power rating on those antennas you build there? Well, you wouldn't, it, don't use them on a kilowatt. Yeah. Yeah. Kilowatt. No, it, it, they, 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 okay. okay. They, they, this uh, twin lead or window line that I have is the 16 gauge, uh, twisted. Uh, in other words, it's, uh, about the, the stranded wire. Uh, this is good, and it's copper, it's actually copper plated steel. So this is actually one of the, this is actually one of the best uh, that you can. The solids, you can get 18 gauge solid, which is a lot cheaper. People have problems if they flex it, it breaks off. Oh, well, what do we have for the club? What? What do we have for the club? This is the, this is the good stuff. This roll, I mean, I got, I got the rest of the roll here. This is the 16 gauge, uh, high, high quality. That's what 50 <coughs> cents a foot. The, the cheap stuff is about 30 cents a foot. Uh, but I figured our club, nothing but the best, right? And the J pole will work two meters and 440. Well, it'll and work to you, okay, the. Uh, you, you haven't worked that out. Uh, well, okay, this this thing. It will, and this thing will get away with 440 because the line's lossy enough. You know, it's it's not something you use as a permanent. <coughs> Go ahead. Can I ask you to just write down the brand name of the ladder line that you're using with the window line and the gauge? Because I've got a bunch of scrap at home that I would gladly bring in and just hand out for free. Oh, okay. Out for several antennas, you know, 10, 15 foot lengths from my cuttings I've done over the years. So what is it? You know okay, well, now. Just let me know. Yeah, well, I got a label out here that says Davis RF is where okay. I bought it from. Right. And if you go to their site, then you can figure out what I got. Well, they have optional. Yeah, they have other kinds, but I, I, I wanted to get, I, I, I wanted to get the stranded. For one thing, if I use, if they use these connectors, it has to be stranded. That, that experiment that I that I did with this with this thing where you. Where, you know, you you can it's not, for a few sides extra. You you can have switch between six meters and ten meters. All right, let's take a break. So we can cover any more questions. <laughs>